and the vid video will be turned off during the presentation, uh, but we will be stopping for questions twice throughout the evening. So if you have a question for the speaker, please use the Q&A feature on your screen. We might answer your question directly or save it for one of the Q&A portions of the presentation. And if we don't get to your question either way, we will make sure you know how to get the answer. If you have a technical question, uh, you can use the chat feature for that and it will go to the right place rather than the Q&A. Please note that the session is being recorded. And lastly, at the end of the session, we ask you to please stay online, even if you don't have your own question to ask, uh, because there'll be a link to a survey. And when the survey is completed, you'll receive an email with a handout and it's gonna have a lot of great resources and information from tonight's topic. Next slide. Okay, so you possibly already know that these webinars are uh, co-hosted by the library, Contra Costa County Library and the UC Master Gardener Program. Uh, the Master Gardener Program has a mission and that mission is to extend research-based knowledge to the residents of Contra Costa County. And this knowledge and information generally falls into one of three categories, home horticulture, pest management and sustainable landscaping practice. And with that, I am happy to introduce our wonderful speakers for this evening, Anna Frankfurt and Laura Brennan Rodriguez. Both Anna and Laura are UC Master Gardener volunteers and avid growers and lovers of these plants. And their talk will really help you get started with a succulent garden or perhaps take yours to the next level. Anna, who's loved gardening since age 10, has been a master gardener since 2013. She leads the Ask a Master Gardener team at the Kensington Farmers Market, as well as other events. She's also the coordinator for Speakers Bureau programs at the Kensington Library. And she's gotten lots of experience with succulents as part of the succulent study group of the El Cerrito Garden Club, and of course in her own yard as well. Our second expert, Laura, Lara, sorry, has also loved plants all her life. She has learned the hard way how to care for succulents. For example, it took her at least three tries to keep a fire stick plant alive, which is a type of a euphorbia, which I'm pretty sure we're gonna be learning about later. Uh, but her persistence has given her the expertise to give us some great information tonight. As a UC Master Gardener volunteer, Lara is a co-coordinator of the Ask a Master Gardener project and is a member of the Jardineros and El Huerto team, uh, which actually brings vegetable garden expertise to our Spanish speaking community. Okay, now we're just about to get started, but first thing you wanna do is, uh, the first thing we wanna do is find out what kind of experience you all have with growing these amazing plants. So we would appreciate it if you, you're going to see in a moment on your screen, just a quick question, uh, polls, um, that if you can answer for us, and why can I not see the polls right now? Serenity, can you launch that poll? Polls vanish from my screen. Thank you. Okay, what experience do you have growing succulents? Ooh, those answers are coming in quick. All right, looks like we've got almost everyone here responded. Thank you all. Um, actually, <laughs> fully 80% of our audience tonight has some experience. So we've got just a few on the other end who are gonna be brand new and a few who have some more experience and have been working with these for a while. So um, I think everyone will get something out of this. And with that, I will turn it over to Anna to begin our information.
Thank you, Jan, and thank you to all who are coming tonight. Tonight we'll cover a few topics. Uh, first, what is a succulent? How to select and grow succulents? Succulent care, including water, soil, and environment. How to propagate succulents? Common problems? And where you can go to enjoy succulents in nature? So what is a succulent? The word succulent is derived from Latin succulentus, meaning juicy or fleshy. Succulent plants, including the cactus family, have a highly specialized anatomy to enable them to survive prolonged drought. They're able to store moisture and fleshy tissue in their stems, roots, and or leaves. They can be found in the deserts of North and South America, as well as Africa and Mexico. They're even found in the high mountains of the Arctic and Antarctic regions. So how do they do this? Well, they can store water. The swollen stems, uh, which can be round, columnar, or barrel-shaped, large, retain large volumes of watery mucus. This photo of the epiphyllum or orchid cactus, which is a lovely plant. It only blooms once a year and only for a few days, but very worthwhile and beautiful. It's also an easy plant to propagate. Root succulents, such as the Senecio coccinea floris shown here, survive prolonged dry conditions by storing water underground in their tuberous or swollen roots. The stems and leaves can be thick and fleshy, providing the plant with additional water storing capacity. Leaf succulents, such as the Crassula falcata or the Echeveria uh, agavoides lipstick, shown here, store water in their thick, fleshy leaves, which shrivel in drought and then swell up again when water is available. The falcata, although it doesn't look like much here, produces a stunning red bloom in the summertime, and this can be left on the plant or cut for enjoyment in a vase or arrangement. It's also known as firecracker plant, as the bloom resembles fireworks and usually blooming around July 4th. This echeveria also produces pretty red flowers in the summer, which again can be stored um, or just left on the plant. So succulent is actually not a botanical classification, but they are found in more than 70 to 80 plant families. Cactus have their own botanic family. And note that while all cacti are succulents, not all succulents are cacti. There are about 10,000 different types of succulents around the world. I don't think we'll cover all of them tonight, but we will show you the, a few here. Uh, the aloe aborescens or golden aloe, Echeveria party dress, and agave blue glow, just a few examples. So what is a plant family? Well, it's a plants that have similar flowers, reproductive structures, fruits or seeds, and are evolutionary related are grouped into plant families. Some examples of these include legumes, bees, beans and peas, nightshades, tomatoes, eggplant, potato, and peppers, cabbage or cruciferous, such as cabbage, broccoli, arugula. This can help us figure out how they grow, what their seeds look like, what their flowers will look like. So how does this apply to succulents? Well, just to demonstrate, both the Senecio mandrelisque, or blue chalk sticks, and the sunflower, Helianthus, are in the Asterisiae, or daisy family. This is a large, widespread family of flowering plants. Many, but not all, will have closely packed flowers arranged in a head shape that look like a single bloom. There are more than 32,000 species spread over 1,900 genera and 12 subfamilies. The Senecio likes full sun, but will take part shade. It's also a fire resistant plant and demonstrates a spreading growth pattern. Produces an unremarkable small white flower that's attractive to bees and is one of the high heat tolerant succulents. Other members of this family include lettuce, chrysanthemum, dandelion, artichoke, sage, and many others. This brings us to another poll question. I 
Laura, are you going? Uh, here we go. So what popular Christmas plant is a euphorbia? Christmas cactus, amaryllis, poinsettia, or cyclamen? Apologies, I'm having a little trouble with the launching of the actual poll. I brought it up and it just goes to sharing, but it doesn't actually relaunch the poll. So. Okay. Um, is it not launching? Oh, here we go. There we go. Here's the results. Apologies again. Okay, this looks pretty good. Um, the answer, which a lot of you got, is the poinsettia. Uh, it's a commercially important plant species of the diverse euphorbia family, indigenous to Mexico and Central America. So all of these are euphorbias. The Euphorbiaceae or spurge family has about 7,500 species and 275 genera of flowering plants. Some euphorbia, such as the trigona shown here, resemble a cacti, but it's not. Other plant members include cassava, castor bean plant, proton, rubber tree, crown of thorns, and, and the poinsettia. Many of these have a milky white sap that runs when the plant is cut or injured. The sap is quite irritating to the skin and toxic to pets. If you accidentally get the sap on your skin, please be sure and wash immediately. They also have unusual flowers that are attractive to pollinators. Some of these euphorbias will self-sow or spread very easily in your garden and you may end up with a lot more of them than you want. So why should we grow succulents? Well, there's a lot of reasons to grow succulents. To start with, they're beautiful. This is my neighbor's garden in the spring. Note the blue Senecio um, that provides a lovely contrast to the other green and blue plants in his garden and the orange coral flowers of the aloes and the Lampranthus. The Gave Blue Flame and the Victoria Regine it just among some of the other plants. In the summertime, this very same garden features many Echeveria and Crassula with red flowers. It's on a sloping Western exposure that provides plenty of sunlight and good water drainage. Succulents come in many forms and colors. This is a few examples here of a beautiful ruffled Echeveria, an aloe, Again, the agave, Victoria Regine, very compact agave, and the agave of Batifolia or Frosty Blue, much bigger out uh, on the agaves. Other succulent benefits, ease of care. These plants are very low maintenance once you have them established. But note, low maintenance does not mean no maintenance. They do require some. Low water use, first noted during the drought of the 1970s. Uh, but certainly high value plant for today. And then firescaping functions. After devastating wildfires destroyed gardens in arid parts of the West, homeowners began to appreciate the way succulents survived and other plants perished. Some examples of the firescaping succulents, aloes, which we saw on the previous slide, Delosperma, Lampranthus hot flash, which is a nice a little compact, um, spreading succulent. Some ground cover sedums, such as the sedum morganianum or burrow's tail, and our friend, the Senecio. Succulents are fun. This is a picture of a pumpkin that's been topped with moss. The succulents are all glued on the top. 
creating a living centerpiece, which can later be transplanted into a container or your garden. These actually will keep going for a couple of months. And an example of an agave perii truncata that's been decorated for the holidays. So how to grow succulents? We like to start with the four foundations of success in any planting indoors and out. We refer, refer to these as good cultural care. Soil is the basis for a healthy garden. In the case of succulents, it needs to approximate the original texture and water holding capacity needed by these plants. Water. Consistent moisture in the soil is key. We all know that too much or too little water can create problems for plants. Aeration. Many people underappreciate the importance of air in our soil, and yet plants will not survive without the pore spaces in the soil, which allow the plants to obtain oxygen and the living things that live in the soil to breathe. Sun. Energy from the sun is a driver for plant growth. Just as for water, too much or too little sunshine can create problems. The interaction between soil and air temperatures, which are also determined by sunlight, are important for succulent plant health. Soil and aeration. We will be emphasizing drainage throughout the talk as this is one of the most important aspects in growing and caring for succulents. To accomplish this, you can add compost and red lava rock or pumice to your soil. Some things to consider in your soil. When planting in the ground, you wanna make sure that you have good drainage, amend your soil as needed. Choose plants that naturally grow in similar conditions to those that you have in your garden. Select plants that need similar amounts of water to prevent over or underwatering. When combining different varieties and containers, such as the one shown here, choose plants with a similar scale as you vary textures and colors. Plant both summer and winter growing succulents to have visual interest in the garden all year round. Summer growers are best planted in the spring, winter growers best planted in the fall. When you plant with this in mind, it helps ensure success. So in choosing your site to plant your succulents, the first decision is whether you wanna plant in the ground with space and sun permitting or in containers. In planting in the ground, you wanna turn the soil six to 12 inches and add your amendments. When planting in the ground, raised beds can provide the good drainage as plants need. Consider mounding the soil for better drainage. Most succulents will need about six hours of bright indirect light. Carefully note the eventual size the plants will grow to to ensure they're the proper scale and aesthetic effect that you're looking for. You can intersperse succulents among plants with low water needs, even if you have little space available. For mulch, you can use gravel, decomposed granite, decorative rocks, or glass. You can actually use ground bark chips, but the soil beneath this tends to hold more moisture, which is not recommended for succulents. Containers. If you want to plant in containers, you can use any type as long as it has a drainage hole. You wanna co coordinate the size of the plant to the size of the container. Always start with a clean container. Some examples, terracotta containers, which dry out quickly, and they can be very heavy if they're large to start with. Small ceramic pots are easy to move around for changing light um, and weather conditions. Or large rectangular containers, very heavy and are pretty much stationary. You can note here the differences um, in planting pattern choices. If you leave space between the plants so there's room to grow, or you can plant them close together for a more immediate effect. The red pot contains multiple cut same size multiple cuttings that took about five weeks to root. And then they could see immediately you could have a nice little arrangement. The terracotta container with the space succulents actually will take seven to eight months for that to fill in. 
So for your containers, you need a potting mix with good drainage. Again, you can use red lava rock or pumice or you know, to go in with your potting mix. Potting mixes for succulents typically have some pumice or lava rock in them, but you can always add. Uh, the soil source will determine the quality that you get. Perlite is often added for soil aeration, but this can retain water and actually can cause problems in the future. Containers need water about every one to two weeks, and you wanna water until it actually drains out the bottom but make sure the pots aren't going to sit in water. Turn the pot saucers upside down to avoid retaining water by the roots. And then you will need to refresh the plants and the soil about every two to four years. You can have succulents in your house. Um, again, the same soil mix as container, gotta have good, good drainage. Allow to dry out in between waterings. Uh, plant these in the brightest area of your house and ensure that there is good air circulation. Which brings us to our third poll question. If I can have Laura. So, this is a true and false question. A succulent doesn't need much water, so I can just plant it and forget about it. True or false? Okay, looks pretty good here. 98% of you got the correct answer, which is false. Water is essential for your succulent's health, especially in the warm months. Good watering ensures healthy roots and a stronger plant. The proper way to water a succulent or cactus is to water abundantly, totally soaking the root ball every seven to 14 days in the warmer parts of the Bay Area may be less frequent in the cooler coastal areas. This replicates the conditions found in nature because even arid climates will get a soaking every now and then. Overwatering can kill your succulents, so make sure to let the soil dry between waterings. So water, one of the hardest parts with succulents. You want to make sure that the plants dry out between watering. There's just no hard and fast rule of when to water them. Check the soil for dryness. You can just very gently dig down about two to six inches with either a trowel or your fingers, or you can try a moisture meter, which can be helpful. If you look at the moisture meter, if it shows the moist end of dry, there's adequate water present. You don't need to water then. Less is always better than too much water. In houseplants, keep the top inch of your soil totally dry. Other watering considerations, ambient temperature and light. If your summers are hot and your winters have frost, this will affect how much and when you water. Plants grown in the coastal parts of the Bay Area generally need less water in the summer. Soil water holding capacity can also affect how often to water. Location in your garden and hours of sun will make a difference. If the plants are in containers, they dry out more quickly than in the ground and will need watering more often. Growth period of the succulents or their dormancy periods when they are not growing much also will make a big difference. And this will bring us to the fact that succulents actually have a season. There are um, summer dormant succulents that bloom in the winter, which is really wonderful, and then winter dormant succulents, which then bloom in the summer. When selecting plants, you want both winter and summer growers to have plants you can enjoy all year round. 
Winter, our cool season growers are also called summer dormant. They prefer less water in the summer. These plants begin growing or producing new leaves in the fall. They'll slow down in midwinter and then resume growing through spring. The growth slows in the summer to conserve water during the dry months. Examples of these are Aeoniums, Sedums, Dudleya, Delosperma, and other ice plants, and Sempervivums. Summer or warm season growers are also called winter dormant. They prefer less water in the winter months. These plants will begin growing in the spring and continuing growing through summer into the fall. They'll produce new leaves and offsets. Examples of these are Crassula, Echeverias, Calanchoes, and Senecios. Some sign indicating a succulent starts sleeping is that it stops producing new growth completely. The leaves might turn yellow brown and either drop or hang limply off the sides of the succulent stems. Agaves are an exception. They do most of their growing in the summer, but they will continue to grow in winter as long as they receive water. We will include a link to this graphic in the handout you will get once you complete the webinar evaluation. So we have an example here of the plant, the Aeonium conariense. Um, this right here is the plant in its dormancy in the summertime. You might think the plant is dead. The plant really just does not look good at all. Uh, the, the, the rosettes will uh, contract, turn different colors, and just and generally look bad. But they will bounce back when they come out of dormancy. And that's really fun to watch. This is the plant that has come out and is now blooming really nicely. It's important to research and determine what time of year your cyclins Succulents tend to grow dormant, so you don't give it too much water and accidentally kill it or yank it out because you think it's dead. When a summer growing succulent starts its dormant period in the winter, it enters a survival mode and it stops growing actively, therefore doesn't need a lot of water. Give it a little water if you notice the leaves get dry and wrinkled, but in most cases, you don't even need to water at all. Just leave it alone until the growing season starts. Brings us to sun. Um, with sun, you'll see the same considerations as for watering. Tolerance to sun will vary by plant requirements, amount of direct or indirect light, or amount of shade in your garden. Ambient temperature. If the, con if the plants are in a container versus ground, the soil in the containers uh, get a little bit hotter and drier more quickly. So where should you plant your succulents and how? Um, typically, if you're going to buy succulents or cacti, the soil in the pots in the nursery is just regular potting soil, which will allow the plants to grow fast, but not necessarily the right uh, soil for them to thrive. So as soon as possible, you want to take it out of the container and be gentle. Just re remove very gently from the container. Get most of the perlite and soil off the roots. Sometimes you may even need to wash the roots if it's indicated. And then put it in the proper soil, fill in and firm the soil, leaving room for the plant to grow. This method is actually very helpful in getting rid of any pests or weeds that might come from the uh, plant store. Once you plant them, wait to water about three to four days after transplanting to allow for the roots to uh, settle. You don't need a really large space for succulents. You can have a little tiny succulent garden. An example is this garden in my neighborhood. It's a very small space with small succulents. There is a very large jade plant on the outskirts. This was actually almost six feet in height. But it can, you can see it contains one of the smaller agaves. This is the lapantha, which is variegated green and white. And it's a slow grower only reaching about 12 to 18 inches in height. The overall effect here is balanced because the jade plant is off to the side and has room to spread above the walkway. If it was in the center, it would be out of scale relative to the other plants. And this is a jade uh, or the Crashula avata in season, which has got its pretty colors and blooms. 
While jade plants can actually be grown in the shade, they would lack the vibrant colors of those grown in the sun and be a much duller green without the red coloration on the edges of the leaves. And they probably won't bloom. Or an alternative, if you don't want the old fashioned jade plant that's been around for years and years and years, consider the Crassula ovata golem, much more interesting plant. This can also be grown in shade. It won't be as colorful as this one in the picture, but it still has the more interesting shape. And you can see in the background here, uh, next to the blue, uh, blue chalk senecio. So if you want agaves, uh, check the size before you plant one. You can see here, this nice small four to six inch agave Americana, which doesn't look too challenging. But they start small, they grow up. And if you have a small space, like the one in the previous slide, this plant, which can reach up to six to eight feet in diameter and height, would definitely not work. They'll grow slowly, but they will grow. This is an example of a large agave planted in the wrong place. When they're planted next to walkways or driveways, they're often trimmed for safety reasons. These plants have very, very sharp points. So in a walkway like this, if it's planted so it's growing fully, it's just going to grab everybody that walks by. So what people have done is trim it for safety purposes. However, the net result here is a plant that's lost its natural grace and shape. Check the plant tag before you take it home and do a little research beforehand and you save yourself and the plant pain and suffering. You really don't want to have to pull this plant out. It's not the easiest thing to do. While we're on the subject of plant tags, read them. They will tell you mature size, light conditions needed, cold hardiness, blooming pattern, and more. Now, if you still want agaves, one thing you can do is there's much smaller scale of agaves. This Queen Victoria or Victoria Regine compacta is a small, compact, very elegant plant. You can actually even put this in a pot um, if you want to bring it inside. Uh, and there are other smaller scale agaves, um, the Blue Glow, Nacocantha, Pink Ferdinand agave, Lepantha, like we saw in the previous garden, Shitagira, and Geminiflora. So plenty of them out there to pick from that don't grow to the huge size. So blooming pattern and life cycle for succulents. Uh, they're either monocarpic or polycarpic succulents. On the monocarpic ones, some of them will take a long time to bloom, but they will produce flower or fruit only once in their lifetime. Typically, they'll flower from the center. Many agaves are in this category, Semper vivum, like the one shown here, some Kalanchoes and some Senecios. With the Semper vivums, they tend to, one of them, like the maiden one here, will, ble will bloom. And it'll actually, the bloom will last for a few months, but this portion will die. But these little offsets are left. Some of the agaves will also leave offsets, some do not. So once the plant blooms, um, the whole plant will die. However, it takes a long time to get to that point. The polycarpic succulents do not die after flowering. Many of the echeverias, euphorbias, aloes, warthia, they'll set seeds or offsets. Um, probably will bloom every year for you. They can, sometimes the blooms will last for several months. Very beautiful plants. So an example to a living and learning on succulents. You wanna use caution when you start your succulent garden. Succulents have become very, very popular. So it's easy to walk into any nursery now and wanna buy all of it. Uh, they're just really beautiful and you take them all home. So I had a new space to plant. I was sent an interesting design by a friend that looked like fun. So I went out, I got some rocks, gravel, and a whole bunch of plants. 
I mended the soil with compost and red lava rock and planted this little garden. Very easy to do, and it looked great for a while. What I didn't know at the time, there was underground water present. I hadn't raised the area up high enough to ensure the proper drainage. Not enough research before I was planted. Um, looked great for a while. However, most of the original plants did not survive, although the Dudley up here in the middle is actually still going strong, but the rest of them uh, went by the wayside. There are succulents that will tolerate a lot of heat. Um, many of them come from hotter parts of the world and they can tolerate more sun and higher temperatures. Some examples of these, um, the agave blue glow, the onium's wort cough, um, Pachyphytum fit cowy, our friend the Sunicio, and the golden barrel cactus. Um, note on this one, the tilt on the way the cactus grows. It tilts a little to the side to keep water off the top to prevent decay. The spines will help deflect wind and they also help protect the plant from predators. And there are cold hardy succulents, such as the agave blue flame. This can handle, uh, it can handle full sun, but it also can handle temperatures down to 20 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The aloe blue elf, sedum spatulifolium, or the Pacific stone crop, Thompson's yucca, the Texas sotol, the semper vivum. Uh, this is the hens and chicks. I actually uh, observed this uh, growing in Ohio and surviving the bitter cold winters and snow. If you don't know the cold tolerance of your succulents and you have multiple days of cold weather and or frost in your area, prepare to cover and protect them with frost cloth, sheets, or any light cover except plastic. This will give you an additional four to six degrees Fahrenheit of protection. And you can always start out, if you don't know what's gonna happen, put them in a pot and uh, keep them someplace where it's not gonna get so cold. So we will pause here for our first um, question and answer session. And then um, when we're finished here, we'll go on to succulent propagation, common problems, and then where you can go to enjoy these beautiful plants. And we'll answer questions on those topics at the end of our webinar. So I'll turn this back to Jan. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for all. That's a lot of information and a lot of great pictures. And um, to everyone viewing out there, you can continue to post any questions in the Q&A. Um, and we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, okay, a lot of people have asked questions about fertilizer and additions to the soil. And I know that we've covered some of that. Anna has covered some of that. Um, but maybe we can just to go over that real quickly again, because even in the last 10 minutes, we've got people asking questions about eggshells and um, <laughs> different things to fertilize with. Did you want to just kind of give a brief review of, of that, fertilizing the soil? With fertilizing the soil, and I didn't actually cover this at all, it, um, you can use fertilizer. What you want to make sure to start with is that you're fertilizing only the plants that are in their growing period. Um, you don't want to fertilize succulents that are in uh, dormancy. Um, you can use a like a 10-10-10 fertilizer, just a um, standard all-purpose fertilizer, but only half strength is what they generally do the best with. Um, with fertilizer also, many of the all-purpose fertilizers come with an acid formula and succulents do like the um, soil and water to be a little bit on the acid side. So you can, but again, make sure that you're only fertilizing succulents that are in their growing period. <clears throat> and as far as other amendments, uh, the main things are, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is, Compost um, is always a good additive or the lava rock or pumice. Eggshells that you mentioned, uh, if you're using eggshells, <clears throat> keep in mind they take a long time to break down. So you may not get the benefit of them uh, 
in some cases, it takes up to a year for eggshells to break down fully. So I tend to put them in compost that's gonna take all that time to break down anyway. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's an interesting question. Are air plants succulents also? And if they are, how do you care for them? Yes, the Talensia, um, they are, you, they, essentially they need to be spritzed with a little water about once a week. You can just set them in like a sand substance or set them on um, a piece of, of driftwood. Um, you can set them in a tree, actually. You can actually glue them down. Uh, glue them onto some moss, um, or I have one that's just sitting in some marbles. But again, just uh, there are summer bloomers and growers, so just keep them just slightly moist. Um, it's one of those things that if you give them too much water, they won't survive. Mm. So here's a question that came in, and I believe it's already been uh, responded to in the Q&A, but I think it might be interesting to <clears throat> others out there. I guess there's a heart-shaped uh, succulent that's popular for Valentine's Day that might be called uh, Hoya, H-O-Y-A-K-E-E-R-I-I. -E -E -I -I, and I'm just kind of throwing that out there. If anyone knows anything about it, any of our panelists or people just might want to make a note of that since it's February. Um, okay, let's see what else. Uh, should the soil be aerated? If you add the amendments to the soil, that will help with the aeration. So I guess no physical aeration, maybe that's what, what maybe that's and When what you first doing. plant, turning the soil over, again, about a, a good six to 12 inches on uh, you know, the turning your soil over will work for almost all succulents, but you don't, uh, not a whole, just lightly turning it over and then adding your compost or lava rock pumice for drainage. Thank you. Um, for the recommended planting season for succulents, is it the same for potted succulents that you're doing in containers as for outside soil? It just keep in mind the when they're, go they're going to grow. Um, if you like, well, we haven't got to propagation yet, but if you, if the plants are in their dormancy, just keep in mind, they're not going to grow very much, but you can plant them. They just won't grow as well. Okay. Yeah. We have a lot of questions uh, from everyone about propagation and that is coming up soon. So I'm going to hold off on those questions for now. Um, since I think a lot of those questions will be answered shortly. <clears throat> um, let's see, does the type of water affect growth? I think. Mm. Well, it's always best if we have rain. <laughs> oh, that, <laughs> because yeah. they like the rainwater. It's a little bit on the acid side, but you can, you know, it's generally we water with what we have. Yeah, I think rainwater is always best. Okay, also a bunch of questions about animals and pests. And again, that will be coming up later. So stay tuned for that. Um, let's see, what would be the best way to protect succulents from rotting in rainy season? The best thing is to make sure that you have adequate drainage in your soil. If they're in pots, you can tilt the pots just slightly. Um, someone has mentioned that you keep a little bit of a, like a tiny pebble almost under it when it's on top of a saucer and that helps drain. So you, the, it, for containers to drain the water off the top, um, if it's pooling, when they're in the ground, it's a lot more difficult. Um, okay. but, Time for just maybe one last question, but we do have another Q and A session. Uh, later on in the presentation. And this last one will be, can you move an established agave? You can very carefully. They're very hard though, especially the large ones are very difficult to move because of the sharp, most of them have these really sharp points. 
but yes, you can move them. Just you have to be very gentle. Their roots will go a little deeper um, than many of the other succulents. But you, yes, you can move them. Not easy to do. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for all of those answers. Okay, um, I am going to turn it back over to Anna for some of those other topics, but you can continue sending your questions over and we will answer as many as we can later on. Okay, thank you, Jan. And thank you all for the good questions. Um, so this is one of my favorite parts of uh, growing succulents, and it's uh, another reason to grow them. You'll end up with more plants than you started with. A friend of mine once said, just recently said, talk about the gift that keeps on giving. So we will show you a couple of the simplest ways to accomplish this. So this, about 10 years ago, I acquired a single cutting of this Aeonium arboreum atropoporium here. It's a beautiful um, rosette growing succulent with nice pretty green, uh, green and red leaves. The initial end cutting it was cutting was only about this size here. Initial end was moist. So I let it dry off for a couple of days till it formed a callus on the end, a callus or a scab. And this is called hardening off. And then I planted it in a very large rectangular container and waited months and months. I, I actually almost gave up on it. But suddenly after about seven or eight months, it just took off. And this has been a great plant to propagate. It's produced hundreds, hundreds of small cuttings. And this is still going strong. It grows in a rosette form. It stays fairly compact. This, right, this particular one is in a smallish container and does need to come out of this soon, about every couple of years. Um, the one thing about this, if it doesn't get enough sun, it'll continue to grow, but it'll be mostly green and you'll lose some of the red on it. So this is a sample of a few cuttings that have been taken off um, the mother plant. Um, and it's uh, the simplest propagation technique. So these, those cuttings were small, so I put them in pots to get them more established. You can cut the pieces directly from the main plant using clean, sharpened pruners, and then allow the cutting to harden off, as I mentioned previously. So you can put them in pots. You can put, if you have multiple cuttings, you can put them in trays. This is um, a section up at the IUC Botanical Garden has its trays of all their succulents as they're getting more established. And some of the plants will create the offsets or smaller versions of themselves, but you may need to pull the whole plant out and separate the small ones to replant them first. Succulents are very forgiving but you do need to take care taking them apart. So this plant is uh, a Pachyveria bell blue. This is a hybrid of Pachyphytum and an Echeveria. And you can see it's in need of a little help here. Um, it's still blooming. And these, the flower stalks can actually be cut off. They can be put in water. Uh, and kept as just a cut flower, like you would do any one, or put into an arrangement. Um, and then you want to remove the bad looking stuff in the middle that's looking like you don't want to have it anymore. And this I decided to take the whole plant out because you can see there's little baby plantlets at the bottom, but in order to get them off of there, it was just easier taking the whole plant out. Initially, this plant, because it's been in this container now for about three years, it initially did produce some smaller little offsets and then I cut off and uh, put in other uh, arrangements. But I took this whole thing out um, so I can make more plants. So this is when the whole plant was removed. You can see the roots are shallow. Uh, there's lots of leaves that just dropped off. Um, the, the stems I cut off and I actually took the leaflets off the flower stem too, and then let them sit for a couple of days to harden off. This large piece here is gonna go back into the container with some fresh soil. But I'll show you what to do with the leaves. Um, so I'm, I set up a container with some soil and um, 
put the leaf cuttings. This is a this is the leaves and the tiny plantlets that have been hardened off for a couple of days. And these little ones up here are the ones that came off the flower stalk. So they're placed in soil. The leaves are placed just so that just the very tip is into the soil. And this is where a small little plantlet will eventually grow. Now you always start with more of these than you're gonna end up with because they probably, they won't all make it, but a lot of them will. And then off that one plant, you're getting a whole bunch more. These are all the tiny little plantlets were at the bottom. And once I had taken the plant out, it was very easy to just cut them. They all had, they had a little bit of a stem. Um, and that was once it hardened off, they're in the soil. These will probably root within a few weeks. These will take a lot longer. So this is, uh, these are two of the simplest ways to propagate these plants. And then once, once they do have roots and they're established, um, again, to transplant them either, either into a bigger pot or you know, wherever you want to put them and let them sit for a few days before watering them. Our handout is gonna have some resources in it on how to propagate succulents in more complex ways. You can actually grow them from seeds really take a lot longer. Uh, and there'll be a link to our uh, YouTube program that was done last year on propagation. And then I got to see um, another slightly different way of propagating cuttings. Um, about a few months ago, a tray of uh, aloe cuttings were donated to the UC Botanical Garden from the collection of a local friend of the garden who was an aloe aficionado. And this is one of them, this aloe uh, mitraformis. And what they're doing with this is leaving the plant, leaving the sock like it is until a tiny hair light root will form along these little areas here. And then it will go into a pot to, uh, to grow stronger roots. And then when it gets stronger than that, then this will be uh, eventually transplanted into the South Africa section of the Botanic Garden. And then I found out that actually I had left some cuttings of that aeonium in a container that I'd stuck up on a shelf and forgotten about. And the plant was actually, they were still alive and there were tiny little roots forming uh, on it. So something to discover. They all, they, like I said, they're very forgiving. And this um, was another one of the donated aloes, which I found especially beautiful. It's the aloe distans are also called the jewel aloe. Very golden spines along the border of blue green leaves. The back of the leaf is almost po polka dotted. And these are also gonna be transplanted into the ground at the um, botanic garden. This particular one get, requires full sun to light shade. So I will now turn the program over to Laura, my co-presenter, who is responsible for the organization of this presentation and a very comprehensive handout. She's going to talk about succulent problems and then also where you can go and view succulents in nature. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Anna. That was just amazing. I'm now going to share my screen so that we can continue with the presentation. Uh, as Anna has shared with you many beautiful pictures, as well as information on why, how, and where to grow succulents, as well as propagate them. Now, I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of common succulent problems, including too much water or too little, too much light or too little, as well as some common insects and fungal pests. After this, I'll share information on some places in our area where you can go enjoy succulents. The appearance of the leaves is really the best way to tell if a succulent is being over or underwatered. An underwatered plant will have wrinkly, shriveled up leaves, as you can see here, and they'll also tend to dry from the bottom of the plant up. 
Obviously, the more severe the lack of water, the droopier the plant will look. The leaves might even look, in fact, like they're deflated and won't feel firm to the touch. The way to resolve this is to completely wet the root ball, but don't allow water to pull on or below them. Protect it from the sun. If it's in a container, you can move it. And if it's in the ground, you may have to provide some shade. If the plant is too damaged, you may need to make leaf or stem cuttings, as Anna just showed us. By contrast, an underwater succulent will look very different. It'll have soft, mushy, almost translucent leaves. And again, as with everything, it may be possible to save it if you catch it early. It's much harder if the plant is rotting in the root up. So the solution to that is to let the plant dry out, remove as much of the decay as possible to protect the tissue that's still normal, and if the removal of all of this material makes the plant unsightly, again, you may have to look to leaf cuttings, offsets if you're lucky, or a small stem, or uh, start with a new plant. So in the case of light, if you don't have enough light, you end up with etiolation. And that's a term you may encounter as you learn more about succulents. What it means is that you get more space between the leaves, or you may get paler leaves than you originally had in the mother plant. What happens is they start to bend towards the light source as they, and they stretch in the, in the course of that. While these plants can be perfectly healthy, they may not be as pleasing to the eye as they once were. You can't fix it once it has occurred. But thankfully, you can always slice off the bottom of the plant and propagate it from cutting sleeves or offsets. Can you detect the theme? Too much light can also be a problem. Succulents require at least two to three hours of bright light in order to thrive. The temperature range that they typically grow in is from 60 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. If they get exposed to long hours of direct sunlight, they will get sunburned. Hot temperatures combined with high sun exposure will make this more likely. The plants develop these kind of irreversible markings, which can be blackish or brown, or in this case, a reddish color. If you are very attached to the plant, you can make cuttings out of undamaged lower leaves. You can see them kind of peeking out over here. Offsets, or again, start over with a new plant. Now I'm gonna to pivot to some of the insect pests and fungal pests that you sometimes see in succulents. It's a very brief introduction. We could literally spend the whole presentation on this. In this and the following slides and in our handout, you will see these links and there too, uh, places in the UC ANR, which is UC Agricultural and Natural Resources website in their section on integrated pest management or IPN, and there you'll find much more information on how to manage these kinds of things. Often ants and aphids are found together. The aphids look like these little grains of sand on the leaves of the plants and maybe any color. They can be yellow, orange, black, brown, or this kind of cream color you see here. What happens is that aphids feed primarily on the sap of plants and secrete a liquid that's called honeydew. This secretion is very sugar rich and the ants like it as a food source. The ants in turn protect the aphids from natural predators making their control more difficult. The good news is that if caught early, aphids can be knocked off with a water spray. Just be sure to dry the succulent well without allowing water to pool in its nooks and crannies. Ants can be discouraged by using sugar and boric acid baits that the ants take back to their nest, which kills them and their fellow ants. Mealybugs can be a persistent and difficult problem to solve. They produce these kind of cottony masses that you see here at the base of these leaves. They're very sticky and they're harder to dislodge with water than aphids. If you catch it early and it's not a big infestation, you can use a Q-tip dipped in alcohol or a spray 
mixture of alcohol and horticultural soap. The alcohol dries out the mealy bugs and they die, and the soap coats their bodies and they suffocate. If it is a persistent or growing problem, you may need to take the whole plant out of its pot or wherever it's growing, wash the roots, let it dry, and repot it in fresh soil. Sooty mold is a fungal disease that grows on the surface that's covered by honeydew produced by the aphids we just mentioned, as well as leaf hoppers and mealy bugs and other insects. It produces this sticky black film on the leaves. A fellow master gardener noticed sooty mold on succulents growing below a fruit tree. It turned out that a severe aphid infestation on the tree created abundant honeydew, which was dripping on these succulents. This allowed the sooty mold to thrive. While sooty mold is not harmful to the succulents, it is unattractive. It doesn't infect plants, but can harm them indirectly because by coating the leaves, it impacts the ability of the plant to carry out photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is how plants convert the energy from the sun into sugars that feed it and support its growth. This can lead to stunted growth and poor health in the plant. The solution is to find and manage the insect pests that are creating the honeydew. This could include the water sprays we've already mentioned, ant baits, or keeping ants from getting into trees where they guard the honeydew producing insects. Our master gardener resolved this by covering the plants with frost shield or greenhouse plastic during the height of the dripping, and this also helped to reduce the incidence of the problem. Our next problem is powdery mildew. It's another succulent pest. It produces this kind of whitish film that you see on the succulent. And uh, as a result, the, the plant starts to um, diminish its ability to sustain the normal structure of its tissue below that. A powdery mildew can happen in many different plants. Uh, anybody who's tried to grow zucchinis in the West County like I have is very familiar with that. It's common in hydrangeas and in other plants as well. It can be species specific. So it differs from other fungal conditions which normally prefer moist environments. Powdery mildew is more common in warm and dry environments. It is encouraged by temperatures typically between 60 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit and shady areas with poor air circulation. The first thing you wanna do is isolate the plant. You don't want it to get on other succulents you have nearby. You can discourage powdery mildew spores by overhead watering, but as you would do with watering to knock off aphids, you basically want to ensure that you do it early in the day so that the plant can dry up thoroughly. You can also prune out any infected areas. Snails and slugs, as you can see from this picture, cause this kind of holes in the plant, they munch the whole half of the top of the center of the plant of the florets. And they also can uh, munch on the edges of the, of the succulent. The main approach is to eliminate their hiding places. They hide in the inside edges of pots, in wood piles and empty containers, essentially anywhere they're basically shaded and oftentimes in moist situations. So what you do is you set up boards or other containers that can trap them. And in the morning, you go out with a bucket of soapy water and basically shove them into that to drown. You can also use beer traps, which they are attracted to and which they also fall into. Or you can use iron phosphate granules that kill them, but blissfully are child and pet sick. So to summarize, these are the general principles that apply to plants in addition to succulents. Check your plants at least every other week. Catching a problem early will make it easier to fix. Isolate the plants as soon as possible. Water sprays can be useful for aphids and powdery mildew, again, paying attention to time. Remove the affected plant, uh, the affected plant parts to reduce the amount of pest or fungus present. Check out the UC ANR IPM recommendations to choose the most earth-friendly and least toxic approach possible 
which may include use of systemic compounds absorbed through the roots of the plants. Finally, learn when to give up and start over with a cutting leaf or a new plant. The link on this slide and in the handouts will give you many more pest management resources in addition to a link to videos of very short length to three minutes to as much as a half an hour uh, on how you can handle many different pests in your garden. So now we're gonna briefly talk about where you can enjoy succulents. We're very lucky to have many places in our area where you can see succulents being grown. You will also encounter knowledgeable volunteers and or staff that can help you learn what grows well in your area and what kinds of conditions these plants like. The websites of the Ruth Bancroft Garden, the UC Botanical Garden in Berkeley, and the San Francisco Botanical Garden share what is available to see at their sites and additional educational resources. Membership to the UC Botanical Garden, the Ruth Bancroft Garden, or the San Francisco Botanical Garden will permit free reciprocal admission to each other, as well as over 300 participating botanical gardens throughout North America. The Regional Park Botanic Garden, the Lakeside Park Garden Center, and the Wave Garden don't charge any admission. You can simply walk into these, but check the links that we have provided in the handout for any pandemic restrictions. The hand to this webinar provided to all who complete our evaluation survey includes books, websites, and many other resources to help you experience the joy of succulents. And now I'm gonna move on to a poll and I'm hoping I'll do better than I did in the last couple. All right, so what we wanna know is if after this webinar, you feel more able to garden with succulents, more able, about the same, or you need more information or help. No one has participated and now I have to figure out why. Let me relaunch it. There we go. Well, wonderful. This actually looks like many of you feel more able. It's very pleasing to know that we have accomplished what we hope to, which is help you enjoy succulents. So now I'm going to hand this off. Whoops, am I sharing these results? There we go. Um, now I'm going to pass this off to my colleague, Jan, who will share some important information with you. Okay couple of things before the Q&A, but I just want to mention here that Laura you, and Laura, you already answered most of these questions that have come in. There were a lot, a lot of questions about pests, and I was trying to keep up with your answers so we don't have to repeat too much. Uh, meanwhile, if you guys have final questions, feel free to go and add them to the Q&A. And while you do that, I would like to remind you all of the many ways that you can stay connected to our Contra Pasta Master Gardener program. Next slide, please. Oh, no, one too many, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the first thing is the UC Master Gardener website, which is basically your gateway to all kinds of information, so much of what's been mentioned here tonight and so much more. Uh, you can also find us on all of the major social media channels um, most of the time. Uh, and the thing you may not be aware of is that we have a help desk. Um, if you live in Contra Costa County, you can get personalized help by emailing your own questions to our experts. Um, and if you're not in Contra Costa County, you probably have a Master Gardener helpline in the county that you are in. Uh, next slide, we're gonna just take a two second look at the lineup of new webinars for 2022. Uh, you'll also be able to find this on our website and hopefully you're on our email list and so on. 
Next slide. Okay, now we're ready to get to that survey that we've been mentioning before. Um, there'll be a QR code and a link in the chat session in, uh, on your screen. And um, once again, if you can get this handed in as soon as sent in as soon as you can, uh, you'll get a handout with lots of links and lots of resources. Next slide. And just a heads up, be on the lookout for an email with one, just one more survey, a follow-up from the UC office. It's brief, it's voluntary, and its purpose is to get feedback to better serve our community, it's all of you, um, to improve the content and value of our program. So if you can get to that when you see it come in, maybe about 90 days, uh, we would really appreciate your feedback and we're so grateful for all of your support for the UC Master Gardener program. And now I think that we can answer some more questions. All right, first question. This one's come up a bunch of times. I've not had success with succulents. What are your go-to varieties? And I suppose any of our panelists can answer that. <laughs> Someone might be muted. Well, I'll start. <laughs> um, it just, I would say keep trying, uh, depending on where you live. Um, Aeoniums do really well, especially now they're in their growing season. Echeveria is another one. Uh, go for the, you know, go for the most common ones that you see versus some of the cultivars, which can be a little more difficult, but um, those two plants, the Aeoniums and Echeveria are actually fairly easy to grow. Um, I, would, I would certainly recommend them, but also definitely recommend that you keep trying. Mm -hmm. uh, always start with, a, start with them in a pot and let them grow for a while first uh, and see how they do. There's so many of those. Um, here's an interesting question I don't think I've seen before. Are there any dog toxic succulents that should be avoided? Well, as I think Anna mentioned, uh, the poinsettias are toxic. And so uh, if a pet were to consume them, it, that might present the problem. Uh, perhaps John has something to add on that. Um, yeah, I could I could step in there. All the euphorbias, um, including the poinsettia, have a sap, uh, a white sap called latex, and it ranges everywhere from mildly irritating to toxic, very toxic. So, um, while I'm not sure which one is which, you have to do your own research on that. Uh, any particular uh, succulent that you have that might constitute the only toxic toxin that I know of that a succulent might have for a, a companion animal. Uh, there may be others, but I'm not aware of them, but the euphorbia is probably um, would be the one I'd most be most concerned about. Does that help? I hope. Yeah, thanks, John. No, that's great. That's great. Um, you know, there's a question that's come up a number of times back to this, um, back to the propagation topic about the hardening and the forming of the callus and uh, why that's necessary. And um, is it for sure necessary is the question that we're getting. I, um, it's recommended that you let it harden off for just a day or two. Um, there's moisture when the cuttings are first taken off the plants, they're very, very moist. And it's just a whole thing with the moisture and the succulents that you want to avoid. Um, you can get away with it sometimes with planting them and see how they do, but it's just recommended to let them, just let them a day, a day or two to harden off. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, something else uh, of great interest um, is this replanting every two to four years? And a few people have just asked for some clarification on that. Um, if you're just refreshing the soil or 
um, moving to a larger pot, um, a number of variety of questions, just question we go over that for just a moment. Well, for containers, um, you definitely need to replenish the soil. Um, it just definitely only lasts for a couple of years like that. As far as the plants, you just see how they're doing. You may be able to keep all the same plants, just clean them up a little bit, take off some dead leaves, um, take off the offsets if you, you probably have them at that point. Um, but you know, it definitely needs to have the soil refreshed. Okay, so it is for refreshing the soil. That's good to know. Um, okay, a bunch of questions about propagation as well. Um, this you may have uh, you may have mentioned something about this. Whether it's best to keep the cuttings indoors when you take cuttings, or can you put them outside right away? Well, I put everything outside. Um, just protect them a little bit when the if the cuttings are really small. I put them in a pot, but I keep them outside. If you're going to put them in the ground, you want to protect them a little bit. Um, it's almost more susceptible to animals knocking them out if they're really little. Um, squirrels, deer, that just happen to walk by them and, and dislodge them. But uh, they can be outside. Just watch them and, and protect them if you can. Thank you. Um, John, I actually have a question for you. Um, there are quite a few uh, people have asked about specific uh, pests, so to speak, that they would like to be able to prevent from getting into their succulent gardens or, um, well, really that's it. And I know we've done some referring to the pest management website. Did you wanna just spend a moment just kind of going over the resources for that? Yeah, I guess I can. Um, succulents have, uh, it seems, I've seen a lot of questions here, so I've been answering them. Uh, mealybugs are one of the ones that uh, Laura mentioned and aphids as, as, as well. Um, our IPM, our uh, uh, UCIPM website has uh, information on uh, both types of pests, uh, not only for succulents, but for other plants. I think one of the things that we've struggled with is uh, the mealybug question, uh, particularly if they're root mealybugs, because root mealybugs, you can't do anything with alcohol. I mean, so um, one of the uh, um, possible alternatives is, is uh, systemic insecticides, which are approved by the IPM website, but you have to be very careful with systemic insecticides, because uh, if the plant then flowers, um, it's possible that beneficial insects could be uh, affected and uh, your hummingbirds and, and so on and so forth. So you'd have to be, have to do your research, I think, if you're going to use that, but it is an alternative. I've known people that have had root mealybugs in succulents and they opted to put it in the green waste, just pull it and throw it. Um, but if you have an established plant and they seem to be struggling, uh, you can try the uh, systemics. Alcohol is good for kind of the, uh, the minor infections that you see and the leaves. You can spray it or use a, a Q-tip, but sometimes that's unsatisfying and you have to keep after it because the mealybugs are quite uh, resourceful and they'll keep coming back. Uh, aphids can be, generally they're easier to deal with. You can just spray them off. Uh, you don't have to resort to any kind of insecticide. You can spray aphids off and usually that gets rid of them. And I just today, as a matter of fact, I found on a bunch of Echeveria I have under a cover, we're covered with aphids and ants. If you have aphids, you have ants. Ants are very uh, predacious critters and they will drive away the predator insects that will kill aphids. So if you have uh, ants, you have to, or if you have aphids, you'll have ants, you have to control them. You have to control the ants to control the aphids. So it's a multifocal type of approach to do that. But all this information is on the IPM website, and it's not necessarily only succulents because these same kind of critters that uh, also impact uh, other fruits and veggies that we have in our gardens. 
John, is there also information out there about um, animals? Because lots of questions are coming in about squirrels, rats, deer, yeah. um, and gophers. <laughs> You know, I, I I don't want to turn this over to Stephanie. Stephanie knows more about that than I do. I can give a few answers that I think might be relevant, but if Stephanie wants to chime in about which critters are the most dangerous for succulents, Stephanie, do you, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, you're taking me away from my question answering, though. But that's okay. Oh, why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The, the critters that seem to bother succulents the most, and, and it is not limited to this list, uh, are rats and squirrels. Those are the two biggest, at least in my area. Um, so that, that would be my answer to that question. Deer usually do not bother succulents unless they're starving, and then they'll go after them. But um, is that, does that answer the question? I, I want to so. add something to that. Um, if you go to the uh, uh, list of books, um, there's a woman uh, named Deborah Baldwin. And on her website, you can actually find pictures of the different kinds of damage that can be caused in succulents by different animals. And so that will be helpful to you if you're trying to sort out if it was a squirrel, a deer, gopher, a rat, and the like. You know, um, they're very difficult, particularly squ squirrels are very difficult to deal with. And, and I answered a question here to somebody about, there's various approaches that you might be able to use depending on how your garden is growing and where it is and so forth. You can use barriers, literally nets and screens and things that might keep them out. You, I don't know if this would be effective or not, but you might be able to try different types of succulents together. A cactus is a succulent. Cactus is pretty uh, ugly when it comes, if it's got nice big old spines, a squirrel or a rat or a raccoon might not want to get into that. Same thing with the euphorbia. Um, not many things eat the euphorbias. Now, whether or not that would protect others, I don't know, but it would be a possible strategy if your if you're netting and your barriers don't uh, keep them out. If I can say something too about deer, um, they don't necessarily go eating them, but they will just tromp on them. <laughs> if um, I know my neighbor with his hillside, after he's planted a few things, he finds them all dislodged. So that's the kind yeah. more the damage that deer will do to them versus eating them. So if they, especially if they're really small, um, deer will just walk by them and either stomp on just. You know, I, I don't think deliberately, but just walk on them uh, or knock them loose. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, we have a question here about handling cacti. How do you handle cacti without becoming injured? Very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. It depends what you're doing with them, I guess. Um, if they're small, uh, you know, burlap is good to wrap them. Old carpeting is good to wrap them in if they're a little bigger to handle them. Um, once you get them dislodged from a pot, if that's what you're doing, you can handle them from the root ball. Uh, this year I had a huge uh, Madagascar palm, which has got big uh, thorns on it. It was so heavy, so we, we could uh, use burlap as a lever or as a, a balancing thing and, and you could, you know, you can keep from touching the spines, but you have to be clever. Um, but I think just using heavy material, and once you get them out, you can handle it with a root ball, and then you're safer unless they're too big. But they're tough going. They're they're tough to deal with sometimes. Thank you. Well, we are just about out of time, uh, so we are going to end the webinar. Thank you again to Anna and Laura for the presentation. Many thanks to Serenity and the library staff. Um, again, be on the lookout for an email with a link to this recording and a handout with resources on this topic. Uh, thank you all for joining. And if people want to hang around a little bit longer and ask some more questions, have some questions answered, uh, we can certainly do that.
Okay, you guys, why don't I ask a few more questions while people are sort of signing out. Uh, let's see. Okay, so you mentioned the root ball just a moment ago. There's a question about planting a succulent. If the succulent has a very solid root ball, should you try to break it up like you might with other plants or should you just leave it as is? You, you can very gently break it up some because you do need, you do need to loosen the roots. You just have to be very, very gentle. Yeah, that seems to be a theme with handling these guys <laughs> is being gentle for their no, sake. I've been, uh, uh, in my colleagues um, have recommended, depending on where, if you're buying a, a succulent from a box store or from a garden store, oftentimes the, the soil that the plants are in are not really optimum for succulents. They have a lot of forest products, a lot of perlite, which holds water. And in that case, since they're still small and you're going to put them in a, a, a different potting medium, it's very nice to gently get off almost as, or all of it if you can. You can't really, but get off as much as you can. Some of my colleagues even will spray it gently with water and wash the stuff off and then put it in the proper type of planting mix. But to... Uh, some of this, the planting mix that you see these cacti and other succulents in are really not optimum for them. And I don't know how long they could live in that, but it's good to get rid of them. But if you're transplanting it from a pot that you've been working with, with good soil into a bigger pot, I, I don't know, maybe Anna knows more than me, if you have to then break up the roots again. Um, rather than just lift it out and gently put it in the bigger pot. Or maybe I always it. separate the roots a, yeah. a bit, um, just to loosen, loosen them up a bit. You just have to, again, you just have to be very gentle with them. Yeah. Um, but, but they are gonna, especially if you leave them in a pot too long, um, like I said, just be careful with them. But you, you can, you do need to loosen them up. Yeah. Okay. Um, propagation with leaves, a few questions here. How do you know when the leaves have rooted after you've planted them? The leaves, if you're propagating from leaves, the leaves are not themselves are not going to form the root. What they will do is they'll just, this tiny little plantlet will come up on the root or on the tip. Hmm. Eventually then a little root will be underneath that, but but they don't, it doesn't root like the cuttings root. So the first, the first thing you're gonna see is a little bit of a, a what, I can't call it anything but a plantlet because they're, they're so small. Hmm. I guess you can't see me moving my fingers to show the size, but um, I, I have, because I have done this in the past, it takes a long time, but um, you do eventually, and you basically you get a little clone of the plant that way. Um, but it's just a tiny little plantlet that comes up. And then you just have to uh, take that and put that whole thing into um, a bigger container. Um, how moist should you keep the tiny succulent leaves um, in the soil when you're propagating? I just spray them lightly with uh, water. Um, not. I don't water all the way through it or something just to keep it moist. It's it's hard to say. It, it's like with all the watering, it's, it's very difficult to say how much you would give it, but you don't want too much water because you don't certainly don't want water sitting in them. But just if you if you mist it lightly with a spray bottle of water, um, just like you do with the air plants, um, it should uh, work pretty well. Um, this question about the best timing of when to prune your succulents. When to prune? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna prune. They said when they start to look really leggy, um, they may need cutting back. Um, at the end, uh, not while they're blooming. Um, after the bloom period is best. 
Okay, by the way, we're, we're just about done, but I do have a request. I don't know if it's possible for us to show the slide again that has the, um, the websites for information. Uh, request to, to put that up again if possible. I also asked the library to repost it in the chat because I couldn't find it under okay. all the messages. Okay. Okay. Sent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you to so many of you for sticking around for these extra questions. And uh, hopefully you got a lot out of this and we'll see you at the next webinar. <laughs>